Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, the stellar session today that we have for the brand licensing conference, where we're looking at really the infinite dimensions of brand licensing that are today taking place uh, across the world. And uh, this is indeed a international panel that we have together where people have joined us from across the world. And uh, I'm looking forward to some great insights coming from them on the licensing front. And in fact, going much deeper into the licensing industry and various aspects of uh, uh, toy licensing to fashion licensing to largely branding and understanding how licensing can be useful. And then we'll also have a talk uh, towards uh, uh, you know, how technology can be an enabler for the licensing industry and also for the retail industry to grow. So let me take the proceedings forward. And first on, I would like to welcome Patty Becker, who is the CEO and founder of Becker Associates LLC. Uh, she's been doing, in fact, she's been doing licensing activities in India for the last 10 years, but now she is more dominantly uh, looking at licensing and distributing in the toy licensing area and they've already signed up a few licensees in India uh, in the toy licensing space and today she will tell us as to why this category is something that uh, everybody should look at uh, in the toy industry from a, either a licensor or a licensee perspective and what could possibly the opportunities or the outcomes be. So over to you Patty and we love to hear you as to what you have to share with us on toy licensing industry. Thank you very much, Ritu. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has created challenges for the brand licensing industry. The pandemic is accelerating underlying trends in work from home, e-commerce. In fact, 37% of all toy retail in the US was done online in second quarter and consolidation. And, how our pro and I wanna to talk today about how our clients are approaching the second half of the year. Since the beginning of Anjar in 1960 and Becker Associates in 2000, We've licensed about a thousand products and our licensees have sold over $2 billion worth of our toys, games, and dolls. We have hundreds of Anjar Classic retro brands, proprietary products, and manufactured product lines available for license and distribution. As licensing agents, we provide unique services for our clients, including global licensing of award-winning innovative products, managing distribution deals to expand territories, negotiating and writing contracts and expert intellectual property advice and brand management, brand licensing and brand extensions. Because of the global pandemic, economic and market volatility and a politically charged environment in the US, manufacturers and retailers are seeking advice about how to proceed globally. The three successful brand licensing strategies we've used are relicensing proven classics, we see risk averse companies clamoring to relicense nostalgic retro brands. The second one is licensing proprietary products. Cash rich companies want IP innovation they can license. In times of uncertainty, it's important not to lose sight of the longer term and use this as an opportunity to review your goals and if possible, make strategic investments for the future. And three, for the past few years, we've seen a trend for companies asking us to make distribution deals for brands and products they've, that are already manufactured, especially customers who don't want to invest in tooling, manufacturing, designing products, and packaging. They prefer sourcing and distributing already manufactured products, which also may have media and promotion they can use. And this is where India can, can be very, um, it can be very beneficial for our Indian manufacturers. Uh, we've been working in India for about 10 years. 10 years. Um, so these are the three elements of a successful brand licensing program in this environment. Our customer-based approach combines launch strategies and marketing techniques to help you extend your brand's popularity for decades and help you create solutions that add multiple revenue streams that address your needs, your time horizons, and your risk tolerance. We provide personalized solutions, which is especially helpful in times of uncertainty. In fact, in the last few weeks, we've, there's been a noticeable shift in CEO confidence and a sense that they're starting to think a lot more strategically. I think chief executives are spending some more time philosophically thinking about optimal approaches rather than just survival. And right now we see classic products trending. Why? Well, as the pandemic hit and, and work from home and shutter in place became a way of living around the world in about in 2020, especially since March, retail sales dropped, especially as we said, specialty retail. 
retail buyers became more conservative. And so the power of trusted brands and known licenses and nostalgic products have exploded at retail. In addition, classic brands are less risky to introduce and less costly to develop. So with continued uncertainty, many manufacturers may wanna seek refuge in safe havens, such as proven classic brands and nostalgic retro brands that have a proven track record and have sold millions. Licensing recognized brands is one way licensors seek to produce income streams and provide a hedge against volatility while maximizing market impact. Examples of classic retro brands we represent include Sophie La Giraffe, which is a $100 million brand, and Geddes, which is a billion dollar brand, and Steve Kaufman, Andy Warhol's protege, Howard Robinson, um, who has 11,000 licensed products on the market. And these brands are all familiar, known, and trusted. Many Antar classics have sold over a million pieces, and that's a lot of toys. Uh, Fireball Island, for instance, which was first licensed um, by Antar to Milton Bradley in 1986, became a cult classic. The newly updated version of Fireball Island, The Curse of Volcar, raised over $2.8 million on Kickstarter to become the third most successful game launch in Kickstarter history. Tumball is another of our products, which was originally introduced by Ideal and is now selling in more than 30 countries. Go For Broke has also recently been licensed in France and the UK and will come out in 2020. Other Anjar, license, Anjar classics include Battle Dome, Sonic Cyclone, Pathfinder, Tricky Trikes, and more than 500 other toys, many of which are available now for licensing. But you can't just rely on the classics. You also need to focus on licensing proprietary products and IP innovations, because when the market comes back, and it will, that's what your customers will be looking for. We all know that market volatility can create opportunity. The second major consideration for creating a successful brand licensing program in terms of product um, in the post-COVID environment is innovation. And I know John from Medicine will be speaking to you about innovation shortly. We're hearing more and more stories from global toy companies that we're working with who have pushed off new product introductions from 2020 to 2021, often at the request of the retail buyers. That's not a surprise, but for those willing to accept the risks of innovation and proprietary products, there may be exciting solutions that don't require a large asset allocation and focus on brand extensions while seeking to ensure product lines provide diversification into different categories or territories and striving to the, for downside protection. Innovative products create excitement and buyer and consumer enthusiasm. Many of our customers that have money to invest are spending time now developing their brands and creating brand extensions that they'll introduce when we have a vaccine that's safe and effective and the world opens up. Thirdly, for manufacturers and retailers, distributors and entrepreneurs who want to minimize their investment, a third option in a successful brand licensing program is to distribute products which are already manufactured. We have brand solutions that feature ease of entry and provide resiliency through a variety of market conditions. So while relicensing proven classics and nostalgic retro brands may be your first option and licensing proprietary products and IP innovation is a second option. A third option is distributing already manufactured brands. In cases like these, our customers have in some instances come out with entire product lines the day after the deal was announced using already tooled, already manufactured existing product from one country in a new territory. They had the factory change the logo on the packaging, purchased finished goods from the same manufacturer, and out it came. We did this with Timber Tots, a brand that was 40 years old, but only being sold in France under the name Chlorophyll. A customer came to us asking for help securing the IP rights and arranging a distribution deal so they could include the range in their own product line. We did, they did, and Timber Tots was a Toy of the Year finalist last year. Fun School, a leading toy and game manufacturer in India, is one of our licensees. We've been working together, as I said, for about a decade. Fun School will be launching Backlash and Jig Stars in the next few weeks. We're currently looking for licensees in other territories that Fun School would then become the maker and supply the rest of the world. They would then become the vendor. Managing our licenses to be sure that they're well-developed and well-positioned in the marketplace as well as being manufactured, marketed, and promoted to their best advantage in multiple territories 
negotiating and writing the contracts and actually getting paid after we've licensed the, con the products requires a lot of time and expertise from licensing agents such as ourselves. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at beckerassos.com for more information. We look forward sure, to hearing Thank you very much for setting the tune, Patty. And I think some of the very valid points you made, and particularly the one that is going to stick to me, and at some point of time, I'm going to discuss it uh, in this the panel is that, you know, you said that classic brands are safe haven. And, you know, I, I would really want to uh, sort of elaborate on that and see what can be done with classic brands. And I think John can maybe, or even Stanley could touch upon it, uh, you know, as to what more we can do with classic brands and how they can be extended into various licensing uh, properties. Uh, so thank you for that. Next up, we have uh, Stanley. Silverstring, who is the president of licensing and business development for Perry Ellis International. Um, indeed, uh, you know, uh, Stanley has already had a great twist with India uh, in his earlier role where he was the head of licensing for uh, the CK, uh, the Calvin Klein brand, and uh, would, was doing various categories, both jeans as well as uh, in aware uh, for Calvin Klein and now he's there in a new avatar which is in Perry Ellis International where he's looking to extend Perry Ellis products into India into licensing and looking at licensing partnerships with uh, the right retail and uh, other partners. So Stanley uh, up to you uh, in terms please uh, would you know love to take your thoughts on fashion licensing and how do you see it becoming uh, more uh, you know more contemporary uh, more, um, I would say, millennial friendly uh, going forward. And thank you, Rita. Uh, as, as it's ironic, I think, a bit to talk about the emergence of fashion licensing in India because those of you who are kind of in market are aware of uh, historic uh, global brands, Tommy Hilfiger, Jockey for Innerwear. And, and other brands that have been commercialized and developed in an important way in the Indian market for years and years. Uh, I think in, in my experience in a prior life, uh, we introduced Calvin Klein underwear and Calvin Klein jeans to the Indian market. And so if you look at the portfolio of some of your larger companies, Reliance and Arvind and, and Birla and others, you know, clearly there's an active uh, marketplace for global fashion brands. Uh, sort of part of the reason we're participating is we want a bigger share and a more important share uh, of that uh, market. So I, I think emergence uh, today is, is, is an appropriate term only because there's really a, a we're at a, we seem to be at a bit of a breakout moment in terms of India commercial. I every morning I get Women's Wear Daily and License Global and License International, but I also get uh, ET Retail. And the explosive growth in India that that we're you know you're experiencing and I'm observing uh, is is really suggests we're at a bit of an inflection point. I mean the the digital development, the online development, the mobile development is really startling. And and I think you know I I when I launched uh, Calvin Klein underwear in a prior life in in China. Uh, we saw some of that. We thought it, we knew India would follow. It's taken a bit more time than I think many of us imagined in 2004, 2005. We thought it was five years. It's taken a bit longer. Uh, but I mean, it's really explosive. I mean, when we look, when we look as an observer from here at what's happening with Amazon, what's happening with Walmart and Flipkart and Mintra and Jabong, what's happening with Reliance, there's a, you know, there's an enormous opportunity. There's a huge population. It's sophisticated. Uh, they have sort of disposable income and, uh, they appreciate kind of global brands and, and what they may represent. So we're excited about that. In, in our case with Perry Ellis, um, we, we've begun working with Bradford and we're, you know, there are, there are new best friends and we're excited about that relationship and exposing our brands to the market. Perry Ellis uh, is, is a somewhat unique proposition in the sense that 
Uh, I manage a top 50 global licensed business within a larger uh, operating enterprise. So unlike some of our licensing peers, we you know, produce and commercialize the brands, most of the brands in our portfolio, which, which gives us kind of a unique USP in the sense that uh, we are brand stewards. We have an economic stake because we own those brands and we commercialize them here in, in America and other markets. And so our kind of our, our horizon in terms of kind of brand management and brand protection uh, is, is really quite critical. It also means that we have assets that we can deploy to support licensed partners in market uh, that, you know, whether it's, it's design and development, whether it's marketing assets and the like. And I think that that is a bit unique. There are a lot of licensing kind of companies today that, that operate different models. I, it's not to say that, that we're kind of any better or smarter. It's just that our operating model is a little bit different. Having said that, you know, we are commercial animals. We love our brands. We, we think we've got a, a you know, diversified portfolio that's exciting and, and compelling. Uh, but we also understand that this is commerce. Uh, and, and so we work very kind of closely with our licensed partners to be sure that the products that you're bringing to market, whether they're uh, sort of our products or whether they're locally executed products and the like, as long as it's consistent with the DNA of the brand and, and in our view is brand enhancing and brand positive, uh, you know, we, we will support that. Uh, I think I, I would encourage everybody over the next uh, day or so to visit the uh, virtual booth that we've developed with Bradford because it does give you kind of exposure to uh, the, a number of the brands in our portfolio. I'm gonna talk about a couple of, of them just quickly because I don't wanna consume more time. Uh, but I, I think I would, I would encourage you to visit that, talk to Bradford, because we, we have a very diversified portfolio. And, and to Patty's comments, at a point in time when retailers and the marketplace are looking for proven resources and kind of brands that have a rich kind of history and heritage, uh, our portfolio kind of speaks volumes for those opportunities. Uh, our, our largest brand is our namesake, Perry Ellis brand. Uh, Perry Ellis, the man who died rather young, unfortunately, was a contemporary of Calvin Klein and Ralph Lauren and Donna Karen and pre-Tommy. Uh, Tommy wasn't yet kind of, you know, in, the, in that pantheon of, of designers. And, and what we've developed over the course of, of uh, a good bit of that time is a you know, $800, $900 million retail brand. Uh, we have 40 licensed partners in addition to our direct business across categories. We distribute in 50 to 70 countries. Uh, so we have a very, very strong and, and uh, you know, wide uh, footprint. I think to the to the point that that Ritu was alluding uh, to to be sure that you develop and commercialize a classic or a heritage brand that's topical and of the moment and appealing to different kind of uh, generations. Uh, it's important that you kind of develop a significant social media and marketing presence around the brand to really reintroduce that classic brand. And we've been very, very aggressive and, and I'd like to think effective uh, in working with uh, not only the social media platforms and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and the like, but celebrity dressing and influencer dressing so that you get to see Justin Bieber wearing our product or you see Chance the Rapper or you see Jamie Foxx or Nick Jonas. It's, these are, all unpaid, it's, it's basically they're wearing the product because they like the product. 
Uh, we've been very aggressive in developing innovative fabrications and products and the like, and, and that's been well received by our partners. Uh, that's our largest brand. It, it, you know, it has periodically appeared uh, in the India market, but we're very anxious to kind of expose it in a, in a you know, with the right local partner. Uh, we have a brand architecture that is our kind of classic uh, uh, product. And then we have a more, a younger denim based sportswear collection, Perry Ellis America, which uh, has a bit more democratic price point and appeals to a, a younger consumer. And that's getting a good deal of attention over here. Uh, another brand in our portfolio uh, is our original Penguin by Munsingwear brand. I think most people will recognize the iconic Penguin logo. Uh, again, there's there's you know significant history and heritage to that brand. It's distributed now in in 50 countries across different categories. Uh, we're very you know we have a very expansive <laughs> licensing program. For that brand and others, we've got 35 partners, domestic or international, and under nearly 100 stores uh, that are operated uh, either directly or by partners. Uh, again, very active social media presence, and and this product again, it's got it's an iconic logo. It's original. It's fun. It's younger. It's creative. It's colorful, and and so. Uh, we're, you know, we're very excited ab about that as well. Uh, we have other brands in the portfolio. I think the, you know, we love all our children. Uh, we have a diverse and eclectic mix. Uh, we have sport brands. We have Gotcha, our surf, skate, extreme sport, urban brand that you can take a look at, which I we're relaunching in here in the States uh, with, with a collaboration with Brain Dead, appealing again to a, a younger consumer. We have our Farrah brand, uh, an American brand that, that's now become a, a heritage Brit brand, uh, ironically, and is important in the UK market uh, and the like. So we have a good deal of, of breadth and diversity in our portfolio. And I would, I, I, I think this is an inflection point for fashion in the Indian market because of all of the developments with online and with mobile, in addition to conventional kind of brick and mortar retail. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ritu. Thank you. I think um, I know I, I particularly liked, you know, how you told us about Perry Ellis being uh, pre-Tommy and then at the same time, you know, how bit by bit you've sort of built up more brands within Perry Ellis that today appeal to the younger generations. And I think that's that's what is required for classic brands to be able to, I mean, you know, one, one example that comes to my mind is that I grew up, I was an 80s kid and I grew up with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck in Disney and my daughter who's 10 years old, she just doesn't relate to it. She relates to a frozen or a product which is of similar yonder because she sees that on television or YouTube or wherever. So I think it's just about how, uh, how even a classic brand needs to sort of find its own dimension. It needs to find its own uh, width as they go forward. Uh, so thank you for sharing that, Stanley. That was very helpful. Um, let me come to John. Um, so John, you know, has a principle that he goes by. Uh, he's the president and chair for Charles Edison Fund. And of course, he goes by the uh, Thomas Edison's uh, great quote that, you know, you have to fail your way to success. And that is how you actually build great brands. And all American brands have been built bit by bit, brick by brick, by failing and then succeeding and then succeeding more and then failing some. So, so that is how the growth really tends to happen. And today he's joined us here and we're really lucky to have him uh, talk about, you know, how today modern brands are going to build, be built. And of course, Thomas Edison himself was regarded as the father of uh, branding. And, you know, there's some lessons we can take from his work and also bring forward in the brands that we are developing today. Of course, more for the digital world and the physical world as we used to. So over to you, John. Thank you for joining us today. Well, it's, it certainly is a distinct pleasure for me to uh, be on this panel with uh, these very, very talented individuals. And I uh, would recommend that we're being introduced to uh, 
uh, to India through Bradford, and we do have a virtual booth. So we have a lot up there, which we would like people to go and see. I had the pleasure of chatting with Patty a couple of days ago, and um, it's, it's a pleasure being on here with David and, and with Stanley. Um, uh, Thomas Edison, as chairman of the, as the Edison Foundations, uh, for 23 years, and I've been associated with the Edison family for at least 51 years. I think I have a pretty good idea what Thomas Edison is all about. He's a pretty young person uh, in terms of uh, developing products and also a seasoned person in developing products. And he's dynamic and hardworking and creative. Uh, and we only started our introduction of Thomas Edison into this world about 20 years ago. And we've had some very, very substantial successes. Uh, and I think a lot of it is because of the fact that we're trying to bring Thomas Edison uh, to the people, to consumerism. Uh, and that's basically one of the themes that we have today. Two ideas that we're going to deal with today, the power of an idea to overcome failure and the great brands that have a great story. Uh, Thomas Edison is noted for a lot of things in the world, like the light bulb and the phonograph, but uh, he did bring technology to the marketplace and he knew what the people wanted. And that gives him, you know, uh, that gives him two things really basically in the modern world that he's the father of innovation and he's the father of modern branding. And, and just by way of background in a world economy of $85 trillion, Thomas Edison is responsible between eight and $12 trillion one person. And that, that, that's an amazing figure. And there are many economists uh, that say that Edison, and rightfully so, is responsible for one out of every four jobs in the world. So it was no mistake, okay, that Life Magazine named him as the man of the last millennium, the person that contributed most to humankind for the past thousand years. And that's because he had products that improved the qualitative life of people. First thing, the power of an idea to overcome failure. One of the things that Thomas Edison is noted for, and it's not in his vocabulary, is there's no such thing as failure. He would say, I never quit until I get what I'm after and negative results are just as good as positive results. And his most famous quote on this issue is I have never failed uh, 10,000 times. I have successfully found 10,000 ways that didn't work. <laughs> uh, so his idea of failure is that it is a bump in the road. You overcome it by leadership and by creativity and by innovation and new ideas. This is exactly what you need in today's dynamic and unforgiving world of business. Uh, you not only have to find the next invention, but you have to be able to sell it. And it's got to have some value to the consumer. To start with first, Edison's first invention was a failure. He tried to get the politicians to do a vote recorder. And the politicians throughout the world, they don't want their vote recorded. They still want a filibuster. Okay. So he said to his team, look, we have to go out and find out what the world needs, and then we're gonna to have to try to invent it. And he came up with the stock ticker, then he went into the home with the light bulb, then he created the motion picture industry, then he created recorded sound, and now you see a big idea of him concentrating on the home, the smart homes and everything else. Uh, but in every brand, there has to be a story. And Thomas Edison has that story. And you have to keep in mind that innovation plus marketing equals sales. But uh, however, innovation plus marketing plus licensing can equal mega sales. So on the first thing, he overcome failure by perseverance and hard work. That's what he was noted for. And the real essential thing is that in the power of an idea, he says, lies in the using, use, usage of it. So you have to be able to have, you can't fall in love with every new idea that comes along. You have to be able to use it and to make it profitable for your client and for the consumer. Second thing, great brands have a great story. What greater story could you have than Thomas Edison himself developing the idea of modern branding 125 years ago in his lab in West Orange, New Jersey. He would take his product he would take his picture and they would photograph it and they would put it next to his famous umbrella signature. And that meant like it was like the good housekeeping seal of approval. It gave you power and it gave you instant credibility in the marketplace. 
this signature that he has and that we use, and this is what we brand today, <clears throat> gives you power and influence and is the symbol of innovation. There's a difference between an inventor and an innovator. An inventor creates a single product or processes. An innovator changes the world. So it wasn't good enough for Thomas Edison to get light bulbs for 12 people. He had to make it universal for everybody, all right? And to do that, he had to create a whole new grid system and everything else, which still stands today. That's the innovator. That's the one that changes the world, okay? So um, we have used the umbrella signature, and I'm going to give you three or four examples. I'll give you three, okay, that really have, where, that have proved to be very, I think, successful, not only for the companies, but also for Edison. First one is Intel. Intel wanted to have a chip for the young entrepreneurs to come up with new inventions. It had to be inexpensive, it had to be cheap, and it had to be productive, okay? They took Edison, they put Edison's name on the chip, and they had a question on it. And the branding placed directly on this new chip with his name and the question next to it created the impression that Edison was asking the young entrepreneur, what will you make today? Second was the Chevy. Chevy Volt came up with a new car, electric car, and it was only fitting that they have Edison in that ad. It was a Super Bowl ad because he's the, he's the father of modern electricity. And when the 30-second ad went on, Edison turns on the light bulb, and the Chevy Volt turns on the battery. It was short and powerful, and it provoked the idea of life-changing innovation without any words just the image of Edison, that was all they needed. Chick-fil-A came along, okay, and they were talking about fashion and now you can get into food. And they came up with the idea of having chicken for breakfast, all right, new concept. Uh, and it was very, very, it, it shows that Edison can transcend all kinds of general lines in marketing. Eating chicken for breakfast, just as crazy an idea, yet just as great as the light bulb. So that went over very well too, all right? So we deal not only with startups, but we also deal with some of the major corporations in the world. Um, I would say this, that the use of the Edison brand credibly gives, gives credibility to your product <clears throat> as being relevant and as being edgy and cool and the right thing. Uh, up on my booth or on the Edison booth, um, I did a TED talk on Edison and uh, it's all available out there. And it's about seven or eight ideas that we use. Uh, and I'm only gonna just briefly hit them, some of them, but you wanna think outside of the box. You wanna do something different. When you get to the fork in the road, you take the path that's least traveled. You wanna fail your way to success. Success demands improvement. So when we do these products, you gotta improve them all the time, all right? Collaboration, I think, is the new competition. This is the new idea that's going out, that we collaborate with a lot of people, and that's our competition, which is good. That helps us build and... Oh, we lost John there. Uh, I'm hoping that he's going to be joining us soon. In fact, he was telling us something really interesting on, uh, you know, on the innovation part uh, of things. Okay, uh, so as we wait for him to come back, maybe, you know, uh, uh, David, would you like to start? I mean, uh, the, maybe we can have John continue. John, are you back? Okay, great. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. Are you yeah. still there? Yeah, we're still there. We were waiting for you. You need to be uh, a little more into the screen because uh, you're stepping okay. out of it. Okay, I'll just finish yeah, up yeah, by saying good with that, that yeah. Edison's ability to sell products brands and ideas in his time and in ours is a testament to the power of a good story. And as industry grows both in the US and in India, we realize that licensing is simply not just putting a name or an image on a product, okay? It's weaving together stories that create the unique fabric of your brand. It's bringing a legacy, long legacy to a new brand or a product that has just begun. It's linking a narrative of being big dreams and hard work into something your customer can buy. It is using history to inspire the innovation of the future. Thomas Edison's most famous quote is, there's a better way to do it, find it. That is my challenge to both you and your brand. Thank you.
Sure, thank you very much. In fact, you know, had we been in life, you probably would have had a standing ovation for the talk that you gave uh, just now and to touching upon Thomas Edison and explaining his philosophy the way you did. So thank you very much there, John. I, I think it's, uh, it's very thank you. Thank you. for uh, anybody who wants to be associated in the licensing uh, program for the Charles Edison Fund and to be working with you to see how we can have more innovative products and collaborative and competitive products coming uh, alongside. So, you know, as I uh, sort of move forward, next up we have David Lim. Uh, David is, of course, uh, heading uh, uh, CTI Solutions and he is actually going to give us a good view about how technology today plays a very, very pivotal role to bring an intermesh between licensing, retail, and uh, you know, uh, the digitization, which today is essentially going to be, or is at least is going to, uh, is being currently looked at as the way forward for uh, distribution to happen. Um, you know, we probably over the course of the last four months, more than the last 10 years, while of course the digital wave has been with us for the last 10 years, but I think in the last four months, what we have realized all of us in one way or the other is that technology will have to play a big role in our lives. And, you know, now we need to at least go forward and see and embrace technology uh, in order to make our businesses more streamlined make them more seamless, make our licensors and licensees better collaborated, corroborated on to how they are going to do business or how they are going to even have good communication line between them. So thank you for joining us, David, uh, here today. You know, we would look forward to your talk and, you know, indeed, um, you know, uh, the, the future is to be uh, empowered by technology and powered by your brand. So over to you. Thank you, Ritu. Uh, good morning from New York, everyone. I think more appropriately, it's a good afternoon to most of you. Um, as Ritu mentioned, I'm with the CTI Solutions Group today. And I got to tell you, we could not be uh, more excited to have participated in this year's India Licensing Expo. Um, I think our preference would have been to be physically with all of you in India, but we're certainly thankful that the wonders of technology kind of allowed us to virtually be all together uh, meeting and sharing with each of you today, despite the uh, COVID impacted world that we're all residing in. Uh, we at CTI Solutions are, are really particularly energized by the market of India. And we believe that your country uh, really represents the next formidable workshop of ingenuity and creativity in intellectual property development. Uh, many people obviously see India as a marketplace for furthering the growth and development of their brands. And of course, with uh, you know, 1.3 to 1.4 billion people, you represent a very significant consumer base. But in addition to that, or in supplement to that, I think we at CTI also believe that the world eventually will see the expansion and development of local Indian brands into that global marketplace. And you know, whether it be Titan or Tata, certainly India has the capability of creating behemoth brands. So we see India as the birthplace of the next new and emerging brand or business that someday could be in the premier worldwide spotlight well beyond Mumbai. Um, unlike the balance of most of the exhibitors that we were alongside of today, um, our relevance to this expo is really not about representing brands or licensees or intellectual product. Uh, rather, we've assembled over the course of the past two decades or so tools and solutions that make the licensing business work much more smoothly and much more seamlessly. Um, having cultivated and sort of grown up with um, some of our clients like um, Nike, uh, US Polo Association, Polaroid, uh, CBS Television Studios, and, and even M&M Chocolates, uh, we've learned that, you know, whether it's sneakers or snickers, whether it's t-shirts or TV characters, the business of licensing really has some very basic core fundamentals that everybody needs to do more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, we have clients that make 10,000 different items for a bunch of brands that are in their portfolio. Um, and we have others that might approve, you know, 20 to 50 in a season that have their logos on them. So what we've learned and what we've built provides scale and, and really the disciplines that are uniformly and globally a requirement in today's business to mutually enable beneficial licensing and franchising relationships. Um, our workflow solutions enable companies that are both tiny and gigantic to utilize software to manage their media assets, 
uh, to maintain assurances across a big partner group that their brand integrity stays at a very high level. Um, we enable people to carefully organize uh, their distribution and their licensing contracts. And probably most importantly, we help our partners avoid costly contractual breaches um, or on the other side of the table, maximize their royalty earnings, all while requiring no incremental hardware upgrades and avoiding costly uh, server implementations or installations. So, you know, basically, if you have a computer and an internet connection, our uh, highly customized solutions that are remotely hosted and fully integratable into your ERP business solutions um, really can start transforming operations uh, on day one. Now, as, as many people mentioned, you know, COVID-19 has injected an entirely new level of complexity into managing licensed businesses. Um, nowadays, not everybody comes to the office. So, you know, how do you review contract terms that are a 20 page piece of paper sitting on a filing cabinet in your office or worse yet uh, in your lawyer's office that helped you craft a deal, you know, two years ago? Well, our products through software as a service are enabling our current partners and clients to never miss a deadline and not miss collecting a royalty rupee, even though their people are working from home, their offices are closed. And as somebody mentioned earlier, it's really the online e-commerce business that is, that is booming. So as India looks to the future to grow licensing and cultivate brands that someday can run on the global stage, um, let us share with you guys how we have helped companies, both big and small, bring order, consistency, and scalability to their method of going to market. So I'm going to close out by uh, playing a, um, a video that really highlights one specific product that's in our portfolio that's sort of most germane to licensing. It's a product that's called uh, ProofTrack. And um, after the video, I think um, Ritu will hand it over to you and you can um, kind of take it from there. Uh, let's see um, if I can yeah. manage this screen share and uh, do a good job of putting this video up. Technology at its finest, right? I'm just gonna make sure that we're sharing computer sound. All right, away we go. Before ProofTrack, gaining client approval for a concept, marketing element, packaging, or an actual product design was a costly and time-consuming process that required multiple revisions with proofs being sent back and forth between physical locations. Today, you can save your business precious time, money, and frustration with ProofTrack, an intuitive cloud-based approval system made for any industry. ProofTrack simplifies the process of submitting and approving designs by allowing permission-based online access between departments within your company, your partners, and your clients. Our permission-based structure allows stakeholders from different disciplines simultaneous access and editing ability to drastically reduce response time and frustration while avoiding mistakes. Our multi-file uploader streamlines the submission process and is engineered to be customizable, making ProofTrack the best software of its kind for any industry, regardless of location. The customizable workflows allows your team's gatekeeper to easily approve and delegate submissions. Progress tracking, internal bulletin board, and message centers are integrated along with a communal calendar to further accelerate the decision-making process, all while keeping tasks up to date. A digital archive and active revision history is easily accessible, enhancing approval flexibility and eliminating errors, making a process that was once time-consuming and complicated fast and easy. ProofTrack, the most intuitive and comprehensive design approval solution available, integrates seamlessly with our contract and royalty management module contract port, providing maximum productivity and efficiency. Schedule a live demo today. Well, uh, just to ask you, uh, David, would you regard this product as a, uh, as a productivity tool for the licensing industry? I mean, is that how it's positioned to be? I'd say it's uh, definitely um, a, a sort of efficiency maximization tool. I think we all find ourselves in a world today where our resource base is shrinking and not growing. And I think it's, we're probably at the pinnacle of our history of time where trying to figure out how to do more with less is the critical key element for success and sustained survival 
I think growth is a great conversation topic for, I think, most of us that are um, involved in business today. The conversation has shifted to ensuring that we can survive and, and maintain a majority of the infrastructure we have, but that requires doing more with less. So I think that's probably the most appropriate way to frame our tools. Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, I mean, of course, I, uh, the, one of the undercurrents which I sort of got from all the talks that we've had, and, you know, they've been fantastic talks, and everybody's presented such great view of the licensing industry, uh, that, you know, even for somebody like me who follows this industry to a certain extent, got a very deep insight into it. Uh, I mean, you know, one undercurrent, as I mentioned, I got from the entire talk was how the licensing industry is now imbibing digitization. And I mean, Stanley, I think made a great point earlier to say that, you know, he understands India and he understands that, you know, there is Walmart and Flipkart and Mintra and Jabong is now part of their portfolio too. So, uh, you know, going forward, Stanley, would you, I mean, for Perry Alice, you know, obviously once your entire licensing program goes as you decided for India and you have multiple merchandise um, uh, coming uh, for Perry Alice in India, would you still want to have a store in India, putting all that multiple merchandise together, or would, would that store be digital only? I, I think we believe in both digital and brick and mortar. I, I don't think that the experience of physical shopping is, is ever going to leave us entirely, whether it's department store or mono brand uh, retail. Um, I think it's an important opportunity to kind of show showcase the lifestyle and, and the DNA of the brand across categories. We, we don't generally merchandise uh, multi-brand stores. Department stores do that perhaps better than we might do. And so we do concentrate on mono brand, Perry Ellis store, an original Penguin store, a Ferris store and the like. I, I, it would surprise me, uh, notwithstanding kind of the, the explosive development online, certainly sort of pre-COVID and now post-COVID, uh, but I do still think that there's an important home for brick and mortar. It's just how, how expansive that footprint is uh, and kind of what's your, what's a disciplined strategy to expose the brand in tier one, tier two, tier three cities. Sure, totally understand. And I think that that's going to be very important too, because you know, once the brand, you want to, I mean, for a customer, you want to see the brand in its entirety, right? You want to see what all products do they have and you know, so while somebody might be exposed to fashion, but they may not be exposed to, let's say sunglasses or innerwear. So you want to sort of see that happening. But I mean, going forward, at least for the year or so, as the pandemic is still going strong, uh, do you see the digital is the only way forward? I, I think, uh, I don't know that it's the only way forward. It's certainly the more robust kind of uh, commerce that we're, that we're executing even in, in our direct businesses. I mean, our digital, our, our e-commerce is exploding. I mean, you're talking 100, 150% growth year on year. And so it's, it is significant. I, again, I, I think until kind of stores reopen, malls reopen, I, I don't, I, I see more retail brick and mortar shrinkage than expansion. And, and I don't think that's going to change, you know, sort of near term. Uh, I, I think the 500 stores, 1,000 stores, I, I think everybody's kind of shrinking that network to what are, you know, profitable stores? How do you operate efficiently uh, and deliver profit? I mean, there are lots of marketing vehicles. I don't think people are still persuaded that, that brick and mortar is a marketing vehicle. It needs to be a, a profit and brand enhancing vehicle. Sure. Um, Patty, let me ask you this. I mean, you know, probably the same question, which I've also asked Stanley that, you know, do you see for toy licensing, um, uh, digital becoming a bigger format? And of course, you know, toys itself today are finding a lot of digital properties too. You know, there's gaming and then there is, um, you know, uh, integration within some other, uh, 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 you know, uh, platforms like Roblox or I don't know, there, there are quite a few, Minecraft and so many others. 
So do you see uh, toy licensing looking a little different in the years to come than what it was in the last couple of years? And how do you see digital playing a bigger role? Yeah, well, digital um, is definitely, you're right, is definitely going to be playing a much bigger role as we go forward. And how big a role that can be um, is anybody's guess. Um, of course, some companies are 100% digital and 100% online sales. Um, but right now, it's growing leaps and bounds. And I think that it has been sped up because of the co corona um, pandemic. Um, so it, it's, it's a very interesting time. When you look at, at some of the numbers, um, you know, retail sales overall in the U.S. Um, in second quarter were 16 percent on 16 percent of retail sales was done through e-commerce <clears throat> as opposed to a year ago when it was 10 percent. So or 10.8, so almost 11 percent. So, um, you know, you see you see quick growth. And I think, of course, that's going to continue in all categories or most categories and uh, particularly um, in the toy business. And also, do you see some digital avatars coming from the toy business? I mean, you know, some uh, something which was only product based might actually get into its own, it become a digital game by itself? Yes, it goes both ways. You know, very clearly now it's going both ways. You have a lot of, you know, YouTube. Um, look, at, look at Ryan and Pocket Watch, uh, Ryan's World, in, and that has created, you know, spawned a whole industry of, of product based on his influencer popularity. So you have that. And um, as you mentioned, of course, gaming industry is, is almost as, big, as bigger than the toy industry at this point. Um, I can remember back to 1977 and early 80s, you know, when the toy industry was deciding whether or not to include the gaming industry and video games, you know, as part of the toy industry and made the mistake probably at this point, looking back, of not including it. And so video games became its own industry. Um, and at that point it could have been an, par, under part of the umbrella of the toy business, but video games became their own industry and, and a bigger industry than toys. Sure. So it's it's yeah. quite interesting, you know, looking back and looking to see. It's, it's looking the industry, you know, so uh, that, that's the way and, uh, you know, the times are looking very different. Uh, John, I mean, I know that the, the organization uh, that you're representing today is the Charles Edison Fund, and you also mentioned that you're going to be working with startups and also uh, for, with corporates for larger innovation. So in one sense, do you also fund innovations for startups, uh, you know, which you feel are in line with the, with the fund or with uh, Thomas Edison's philosophy? Uh, we do some of that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have been involved in some startups, uh, especially in the United States and in Canada. But mo most of the mo most of the things that we do is really in the area of innovation because we we had a we had a meeting five or five to seven years ago where we invited all these aficionados of Edison, and they came up with two things. One, the light bulb is the symbol of a new idea. Okay, and that is always ascribed to Edison. And the second thing is that he's the father of innovation. So innovation cuts through all of these different categories from healthcare, okay, to fashion, to food and everything else. So our biggest problem is to make them relevant, to make them current, okay? And to show, and we've done that in a lot of areas. I, I was mentioning uh, a couple of days ago to, to, to Patty, that even in the toy area, we have done that. We have all kinds of educational series that are set up with Edison, surrounding Edison in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, and you add the A into that and it's STEAM. So we build on all of that. And it's interesting that we're talking about digital. I think <clears throat> digital is gonna be a bigger role. There's no question about it in the future. I don't know how much bigger that's gonna be. Uh, I saw where they, we have ProTrack. My background is law. So we, we pretty much do these contracts very, very quickly or, and we do a lot of it over the internet. Most of our business comes right off the internet, comes right off our website. And we do have agents that work for us. But um, I, I think with COVID and everything else, these Zoom conferences are, are, are terrific. I mean, and it's gonna be, we don't know what the new norm is yet, but if Thomas Edison said, like I ended my quote, there's a better way to do it, find it, we're gonna find it out pretty soon. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's true. <laughs> I totally agree with you there. Um, you know, uh, David, let me ask you this, and probably, you know, anybody in the panel can contribute to it. So what are the structural changes you feel will happen in the licensing industry because of the pandemic? I mean, you know, in the sense that while things were changing for the licensing industry for the last five to seven years, but particularly, you know, what, what do you think in the entire composition or the structure of licensing is now going to change in a very, very large way, of course, partly because of technology, but also partly because of change in business practices than what they were happening earlier. Uh, my answer probably doesn't relate too much to technology, but it feeds off the theme of doing more with less. I mean, I think one of the key components that we're gonna to start to see in licensing and product development in general is uh, fits into that, you know, kind of do more with less. I think there's gonna be a sort of a circumspect skew reduction. Um, I think you're gonna uh, try to um, have manufacturers and licenses try to hit more home runs. And in some ways, the whole digital marketing component and the social media component of that almost allows brands to tee up big winners um, in that digital space. It costs them very little money. They don't have to do massive print runs of things, uh, but they can get impressions of products out into the marketplace, use influencers to create success stories. And, and what that does is uh, sort of reduces the number of things you got to throw against the wall to create something that's going to stick. Sure. Anybody else who would like to comment on this? Stanley, Patty? Over to you, Patty. <laughs> I'm... Uh, John, yeah. would you like to say something about it? Anything about structural changes in the industry? Uh, I don't really know about too many structure changes in the, <clears throat> you know, in the industry. Uh, we've been at it for 20 years. Uh, I just think that a lot of it is going to be much more on the internet. And uh, it's with COVID-19, uh, there's going to be a lot of innovative things that are going to be coming up. And it's going to, whatever is going to be the new norm down the line is going to be the new norm. We just have to see how that's going to play out. But um, uh, I, I, think, I, I think the digital area is going to be much bigger. Uh, I don't know how big and I don't know how you quantify that yet, but we, we've seen that that's a trend in that area. Sure. Uh, Ritu, I, I might inject and add in something that is um, maybe more towards the structure element that you talked about. Um, I think that we were kind of joking in the green room amongst all of us that, you know, we all find ourselves doing so much less uh, significant travel, especially global travel to other places. Um, I'm sort of reminded of a, um, a, a project that we worked on for a client just post COVID that uh, really does talk a little bit about the reduction or the change in infrastructure. And that's, um, you know, a lot of our partners have uh, very global footprints in terms of their manufacturing partners, whether it's subcontractors, licensees and the like. And, um, the, the general custom has always been for the past 25 years that you require on-site visitation for those partners. You want to see their factories. You want to see how their people are treated. You want to see um, the working conditions. You want to make sure that uh, what's going into the factory is coming out the front door and not at all going out the back door. Um, but we uh, were fortunate enough to be tasked with the challenge of creating an online factory audit tool. And uh, effectively, uh, with the inability for anybody to have as much uh, transparency and travel um, in their regular life or in their business function, um, they were required to be innovative and to try to take um, what money they had that they would have traveled with and figure out how to replicate um, an audit track or a paper trail or collection of images and things like that. And uh, we were able to create an online database that basically was a portal for all of their partners, all of their manufacturing. And we actually also built um, a portal that enabled potential manufacturers to go through the vetting process um, and to apply to be a potential manufacturing or part of a manufacturing matrix for um, a, a multinational conglomerate. So, I mean, I think that's a great example of, of infrastructure that needs to shift and needs to change because the touch points are just not the same as what they used to be. And, um, you know, 
somebody's going to make a lot of money predicting when we're going to come out of COVID. But in the meantime, the rest of us mortals have to figure out how to continue to do our jobs and run our businesses. Sure. But yeah, this I, is I, I think one of the big surprises that's come <coughs> from the pandemic has been has been the desire for people to continue to work from home and employers' willingness to let them and see the pr productivity levels increasing. Um, you know, of course, we've been working remotely and, and doing remote calls for many, many years, you know, and anybody has who works globally. Um, but this has really expedited kind of uh, the entire situation. And I think um, especially uh, it has really um, helped the acceptance of remote work. Um, and, 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 and it has evolved, right? In the beginning, you saw people's dogs, people's kids walking by. Um, and, it, and it was nice to almost feel the other person. You, you really could understand them as a whole human being and not just um, as a business colleague, you, you knew their house and you knew <laughs> everything that, uh, you know, more about them. And, and that's kind of nice. And so I think it has fostered relationships in a deeper way. Sure. No, uh, Ritu, this, I, I don't know how much time I, mean, I don't know how much time we have, but I mean, clearly the the evolution from kind of traditional wholesale and then brick and mortar to online is going to create significant changes both in in terms of product and product development that are user friendly online. Certainly, all of the marketing assets and and you know the social media aspects of brand development and brand exposure are are really changing quite dramatically, and we're already seeing that. I the only other thing that that again, fashion as perhaps distinct and, and to character and entertainment is. I, I think what we're what we're seeing in Asia, and, and I think we will see in India and other markets, is partnership and collaboration with local partners. The the notion of someone developing and making investments to develop a fashion brand on a three year or a five year term is, is just not going to work. I, I think over a longer haul, I think people are looking for more significant commitments. Uh, from licensed partners. I think partners, brand owners are looking for more significant sort of uh, commitments from their partners. And that's going to uh, develop into whether they're conventional licenses or different, more creative joint venture models and the like. That I think in fashion is going to be a structural change as we keep moving forward. People are just not happy to make <laughs> three investments over three year cycles and live at the mercy of an expiring contract. Sure, no, totally agree. Uh, but you also but see- you think, you think they're gonna be longer? You think the terms will be longer ultimately? Yes, yeah. yes. And also with D2C uh, model becoming very strong now, do you see that inventories, the way they have been um, kept, the way they have been handled, the way they have been ordering has been done, that too is going to see some changes? Uh, in in to. terms, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, the investment in in sort of parked inventory is is not interesting for anybody, kind of from a working capital standpoint. So it's really, you know, kind of shrinking the timeline for product development to product, you know, execution and, and delivery uh, and working on the supply chain kind of side of the business is really becoming more and more critical for everyone. I totally agree. I mean, we're seeing more and more of our customers coming to us, a big and small, you know, who want product that's already manufactured and they're willing to partner with what was previously their competitors. They don't necessarily, they want our intervention. Um, they don't necessarily want to go directly, but um, you know they, that increases the speed to market. It, it decreases their development time and expense, and it's becoming a major force in in the toy business, at least. Surely, David. This is John. This is this is John. Yeah. I just have a couple of hello. Yeah, we hear. Yeah, uh, just a couple of concepts on the structural side. Uh, we we've been. I kind of think boosted a lot by the fact that there's a, a lot of more interest in heritage branding. It's coming out of London and, you know, with artifacts and all of these other things. And at the Edison site, we have, it's worth 5 billion US. We have 400,000 tangible artifacts and 
the largest collection of papers in any in, in the world, even more than Leonardo da Vinci. So structurally, heritage branding, I think, is going to help us down the line. And, and second of all, uh, my wife, I lost last year after 55 years of marriage, but we traveled all around the world. I still think that you I mean, I have an appreciation of India and the markets because I've been there and I, I've experienced it. And I, I don't think there's going to any there's going to be a, there's not going to be a substitute for that uh, completely. I think you're going to have to get in and understand the culture of a lot of these different places. And you can only do that by traveling. So I don't think it's going to be totally everything on the Internet. I don't think it's going to be just totally everything digital. Uh, I think it's going to be. You know, we're not going to all be robots. We have to really experience some of the human condition aspects of it. Just sure. my thoughts. Yeah, totally agree. And thank you for, uh, you know, looking and thinking of India in such a charming way. It's, it's always good to hear about your country like that. Uh, David, any final thoughts? We've already overshot the time. I'm sorry for that. But the conversation was very interesting. And so I kept it going. Uh, so any final thoughts on inventories? I think you were going to say something about it. And then it just sort of... Uh, yeah, I think it, it's it's uh, uh, somebody said it uh, well that the, there's just not an appetite for uh, static inventory that's not productive. I mean, I think it fits into that general uh, bumper sticker. We've kind of said that everybody's got to do more with less and to have any amount of um, assets sitting unproductive, whether it's inventory, whether it's capital dollars, um, whether it's people, um, it's, it's just not going to be tolerated. I mean, I think that the, the market forces will um, virtually eliminate that. But I, I think the one interesting thing that um, wasn't expressly said, I think a couple of people talked around it, but um, in my background, it's particularly um, sort of meaningful is I think there's gonna be a real pressure to reduce lead times in manufacturing. Um, certainly reducing product development times and things like that. But um, I mean, that compression of lead times in manufacturing, I think is gonna be um, a, a pressure and a force that on one side is impossible to avoid but there are breaking points. Um, and I think what will be very interesting to see is, you know, where the, uh, the balance kind of um, evolves into and whether you get pushback, whether it's from, because you, you can't make everything immediately. There's always gotta be some repository of, of stuff, inventory, raw materials, whatever it is that is ready to go and ready to deploy. But um, I, I think the funny sort of example is um, maybe when you talk to um, a housewife or, um, that has built up a, an inventory of things in a refrigerator in the freezer, and then they go through an experience where they lose power and they're forced to throw things out. I mean, for the next you know, month of that household, that freezer sort of remains empty. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that that sort of parallel uh, is you're gonna find sort of run backwards into uh, manufacturing supply chain, product development, and all those other kinds of cycles. Sure. So with that, I want to thank all of you for joining this conversation today. It was a great panel and I think some uh, wonderful insights that all of you have shared. And indeed, the industry is on the brink of change. And I think that everybody is thinking of models which are more efficient financially uh, from a point of view of people and talent based optimization. And also to say that, you know, it what would eventually lead to better business practices going forward. So I thank each and every one of you, Stanley, Patty, David, uh, John, uh, for sharing these wonderful um, uh, you know, uh, insights and some wonderful ideas with us here today. And I sort of looking forward to next time, not to meet you on the screen, but really more in person as we see your products and feel them when you come to India. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, George. Bye. Okay, thank you.